Well, good morning. My name is Scott Norman, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here this morning uh, while Pastor Tim is away with Tyler um, to, to bring the message to you guys today. And, uh, you know, we've been praying about this all week. Tyler and I kind of got together, and, um, you know, we really want to, uh, as the screen here says, give everyone the power of thanksgiving. Um, you know, we're in that time where now Thanksgiving's over, and uh, you might have some Christmas decorations up, you might have done some Christmas shopping already, and so forth, and we go from that time of Thanksgiving into that time of consumerism and greed, is where we go to, it seems, from, or a lot of people go to from Thanksgiving to Christmas, and we really want to maintain our focus here on uh, Thanksgiving. We're hoping that the, the message will be a way to kind of focus on what it's like to live a life to change our mind to thankful so that we can live thankful. Think thankful and live thankful is what we'd like to do here today. So last week, we wrapped up a series in Philippians, and uh, the whole series revolved around giving God the glory so that we can experience real joy. And Pastor Tim gave us a main point through that series. Does anybody remember that main point? It should be in our minds pretty decently at this point, but the series main point, joy is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of Jesus. Through this series, we're able to hear from the Apostle Paul, and when he gave his letters to his church, Paul oftentimes had a theme to all of his with all of his letters thanksgiving joy and prayer and we see this reoccurring and that's what you know I I read these and I just really I what I would give to be able to live this out yeah in in Philippians 1 and it's 3 and 4 I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for you for all of you I always pray with joy. And Paul continues in Ephesians 1, 16, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. We continually see the theme of thanksgiving and joy and prayer. And in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's what we want to continue with today. We want to take that next step and we want to have that same attitude of prayer and thanksgiving and grow in our relationship with Christ so that we can actually recognize and be thankful longer than just through Thanksgiving weekend, all right? Um, and you know, as I, as I read these scriptures and, and prayed and focused on getting ready for this uh, week, Pastor Tim, a couple weeks ago, some of you might remember, he did a, uh, a slide with not Philippians 4.8. You might remember that. It really impacted me because it got me thinking that you know, myself, along with many others, the way that, the, that we go about not recognizing um, or we do things that are the opposite of what scriptures tell us. Some of the key words in that passage in Philippians 4, 8, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, praiseworthy, all of those things that we're supposed to put into practice and yet in that slide, Pastor Tim had things like ugly, lies, deceit, all those things that we oftentimes allow ourselves through our worldly beings to focus on rather than what scripture actually tells us to. And that got me thinking regarding thankfulness. If I think the other way, if I recognize ways that I've had this happen in my life, it helps me to be able to recognize when I'm not being thankful or showing an attitude of gratitude kind of when, when I need to, to people that have done things for me. If you've ever experienced that person 
that you bend over backwards. You try everything you can to please, and it's just never good enough. You never get that thankfulness. I've had the opportunity to get to know many of you through the growth track, and uh, you might you might remember that I teach and coach. So along the lines of thinking the opposite of thankful and then reminding you that I teach and coach high school kids, you might know already where this is going. But, um, you know, my, my wife and I coached uh, for a long time uh, basketball, and our family was just immersed in this. Um, you know, we brought the kids into our home, team meals, kids would come over, back door was always unlocked, that's the great thing about living in Wayne County, back door was always unlocked, the kids would come in, grab a pop out of the fridge, sit down on the couch and watch TV and all this stuff, and we tried as often as we could to give them opportunities outside of the game of basketball to continue to grow as people, and at that time, my wife and I, we were a lot younger and crazier, so we were leading a youth group while we were coaching and all this and that, so we were the youth pastors at a local church, and a lot of times on Wednesdays after practice, we'd load my truck up with kids, and we'd take them with us to church, and we'd have dinner there, and then we'd do the message with them, and then we'd take them back to the school so they could go home, so we were giving all these opportunities that, that we thought, you know, we're trying to do what's best, we're trying to give kids chances, and then, as you probably guess, we get that one child who may not be developing as, as quickly as, as a player, may not be as gifted athletically, and they're just not getting the playing time that some other people do. So you get the disgruntled parent, and you get the meeting. And so we get to have the meeting, you know, with parent and principal, and my principal lays out all of the things that we've done, you know, all the things that I just mentioned, and he threw one in. He said, you know, at the end of the fall sports season, didn't Scott load up his truck with five of your daughter's best friends and teammates and drive to Columbus to support her in her cross-country state, uh, state meet? Yeah. And as soon as my principal got done talking about all those things that we had done, this father looks at him and looks at me and says, that's his job. And I like uh, waited for a second, tried to pick my jaw up as quickly, quickly as I could. And it was in that moment, this is years ago, it was in that moment as a young teacher and a coach that I thought, wow, people can be so ungrateful, so unthankful for what they have and you know it, it was this situation that I realized that here a parent had demands and expectations that were already being met but did not have thankfulness for what was being done all right and from that moment there were you know I, I have my own kids now and, and I remember that and I've always said you know that's kind of the not Philippians 4.8. That's my way of, it was a great learning tool for me to understand, I don't want to be that when I have my, my kids down the road and so forth. So, you know, we came up with a few uh, other examples here that, that we can kind of ask you guys about. Have you ever, have you ever given a gift and received the look of disappointment when it wasn't something else? You're excited to give somebody a gift. You hand it to them, they open it up, you're ready for the reaction, and it's not exactly what you were hoping for because it's not what they were expecting to get in that situation. Or how about this one? You've helped your child or another child with homework as they grumble through actually upset at your wishes for success. How dare you want them to succeed so they're going to grumble their entire way through with, a, with, with no real attitude of thankfulness. And my, my personal favorite, the last one, have you cleaned the house and your spouse walks in and says, man, this place is a mess. We really need to clean. <laughs> you know, we, we, we fall into these things all the time where we do things and yet we don't get that, that reciprocated thankfulness that we're doing trying to help people with and you know it's it's those situations that really you know then they start to program us into other ways where we forget the simple things how blessed we are with where we live with 
the idea that we get to come home from work every day and have food on the table, um, that we get to, you know, how nice is it to be able to take a nice warm shower before going to bed? Um, how, how nice is it to have a comfortable mattress to fall into? All of those things that we overlook, you know, Pastor Tim went on, went on his trip and we saw pictures of that and, and how much less fortunate others are, but the joy that they were able to show because they had changed their thinking so that they could live a thankful life. Now, we don't want to be all doom and gloom, so, you know, we do want to get some good news out of this. Well, what is the good news? We do hold some pretty decent company. All right, Jesus experienced unthankfulness while he was here. Okay, in Luke 17, 11 through 19, it says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going, th going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Let's pause there for just a moment. Imagine that. Imagine, you know, put yourself in that position. You call out to Jesus. Jesus answers and actually does what you ask. They were cleansed. Now, I don't know about you, but I would certainly hope that in that situation myself and the group of people that I'm associated with and, and, and walking with and calling out to Jesus with, I would hope that we would give an attitude of thankfulness. So along those lines, it continues with one of them. When he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, I love this question, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one has returned to give praise to God except this foreigner. Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now, if we pause there for just a second, first of all, I, I, the, the, what, a, what a legitimate question. Ten people, all cleansed, one comes back with thankfulness. But I think it's through that into the next part where this is pretty awesome. Because imagine having Jesus look at you and say, your faith has made you well. That would be, I, I'd be overtaken, all right? Jesus telling me, your faith has made you well. And when we think about the result of that, or, or why that came about, I should say, why did he, why did he get this statement? One of, one of ten got this statement. He got it because he had an attitude of thankfulness. He was the one that came back and showed thankfulness and with that had his faith confirmed by Jesus Christ. I think that's absolutely awesome that we can see that through scripture and I think, I'm gonna let Tyler take over, I think that that can still be done today as he's gonna continue with. All right, so we're going to go ahead and break down the scripture in Luke in a little bit more details, all right? There's a lot of information here, believe it or not, about what has taken place during this time, all right? So it says, now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. What's important here to understand is that Jerusalem was in the south, all right? Israel was here, and Jerusalem was in the south, I'll talk about why that is important later on in the story. As he was going into the village, 10 men who had leprosy 
met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Jesus, have pity on us. What's important here is, is to understand what leprosy is. Leprosy was this nasty disease where literally your skin would start to rot off. All right, this, this skin disease could last all the way up to 30 years. It was a painful, long, and nasty death. There wasn't a whole, a whole lot of cure for leprosy at that time. And not only was leprosy so bad on, on the outside, but also it was very contagious. So literally, you would be outcast from your family, you'd be outcast from everyone and put outside the city. And you weren't allowed inside the temple to worship God. So literally, you were outcast from everything. And that's why you saw these 10 men who had leprosy, they all hung out together because they had to survive and learn how to survive. There were literally colonies during the biblical times of people who had leprosy, all right? Not only that, but there's even more. During biblical times, when someone had leprosy, they believed that that person was very sinful inside. And so they believed that they had did a lot of sin to get the leprosy. That was their, their thought process behind that. All right, so they were uncleaned is what they considered them as. So literally, whenever they were around people, whenever lepers were around people, they literally had to say, unclean, unclean, I'm unclean, to everyone who they came in contact with so that people wouldn't touch them and become, um, and become lepers themselves. All right, so it was a very nasty, a very nasty thing to have leprosy during the biblical times. So as you can see, they stood at a distance, right? Because that's what they had to do. That's what the law made them do. They had to stand at a distance from people and they called out in a loud voice. You see, when you had leprosy, your voice would also get ulcers in them and you couldn't speak very loud. And so literally, you would, you would, it would hurt you to speak. So these 10 men had to kind of come together and like, God, master, look at us. Have pity on us. And as we go through the next scripture, we see it says, when he saw them, he said, go, show yourself to the priest. In biblical times, this was a normal thing that would happen. All right, if you were unclean in any way to be allowed back in the city, you would have to go to the priest and the priest would give you permission to come back to the city. So this was a normal custom back in biblical times. And it says, go, show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. This is pretty fascinating right here because you see right here, God gives them a command. God says, go, and they went. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure exactly what took place here, but I do know that they were following God's commands. You see, if I was one of them, I might say something like, God, it hurts for me to walk on my feet. Do you not realize I have leprosy? Right? Sometimes leprosy would get so bad, most of the time, the first things you would lose is your fingers and your toes and your eyelids and your hair. All right? So that was the first thing that would happen. And so most likely, some of these men might not have had any feet because sometimes your feet would literally fall off. So can you imagine these men, if I was one of them, I'd be like, Jesus, why can't you just heal me now? Why can't you just heal me? Just touch me. Right? Because that's what God, that's what Jesus did in the past with the leopard. Jesus just touched him and was healed. But no, these men, these 10 men said, yes, I'm going to follow God's commands. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. Right, it's the first time he probably had his voice back, so he was pretty pumped to have his voice and be yelling and thankful for what God has done for him. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then this is weird. It says, and he was a Samaritan. Now, as I said earlier, Jerusalem 
was in the south, all right? In the south where, where mostly Jews lived, south of Israel, all right? So that's where the Jews lived. Samaritans were from the north. The Jews had a lot of hatred for the Samaritans for a number of reasons. They believed, and the Bible says, that they were the most hated people. The Jews believed that they were the most hated people on the earth. They hated them. So here you have a Samaritan who's around Jews, and most likely, most theologians would tell you that the other nine men were Jews. So here you have a Samaritan man who has leprosy, all right? So he's the outcast of the outcast. He's the low man on the totem pole, right? And so that's important to understand because the lowest man on the totem pole, the man who was probably treated the worst out of those 10 men, came back and had true worship for what Jesus had did for him. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other men? Where are the other nine men? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? You see, God, Jesus was kind of being a smart aleck here, right? He's like, he knows where the other men are. They were probably being pretty selfish. My guess, and it doesn't say this in the Bible, but my guess is they probably went to be with their families that they hadn't seen for many years. Right? Leprosy could have lasted all up to 30 years. Some of these men could have not seen their wives for, for 10, 20 years, not seen their kids for that long. They probably ran back to be with them. Or maybe, right, maybe they, they loved alcohol, right? So they ran to the pub, right? Because they couldn't be around people um, when they had leprosy in the past. So maybe they ran to the local pub. I'm not sure. But we know that they did not return to Jesus. And then Jesus says, then he said this to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Jesus isn't talking about his physical being at this point. He's talking about his spiritual, right? He's talking about that his faith in action made him well. Not only was this man looking for Christ at the, at the very start, but he was also looking for Christ after God had healed him, after Jesus healed him. You see, someone with a thankful heart is someone who has true commitment. All right, as we talked about in Philippians and we saw Paul, we saw him no matter what circumstances that he was in, he had true commitment or contentment. Right? Even when he was in prison, Paul had contentment because he understood the end game. Someone with a thankful heart has true joy, as we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Not joy of materialistic or earthly things, but tr true joy that only comes from God. Not only that, but someone who has a thankful heart is humble. They understand, just like the man in the story. Just like the Samaritan, he understands who God is, and he's at the feet of Jesus, worshiping and praising Jesus when Jesus had healed him. That's a humble spirit. When we have that kind of spirit and that kind of heart, others are drawn to us and we're able to point the direction to God, right? God gets the glory. We bring pleasure to him and others are drawn to him because they're able to see a true thankful heart, which ultimately brings unity, right? Tim, Pastor Tim talked about that. So God wants unity and as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Satan, what's division? Right? Satan, in the Bible it says Satan is the master of all lies. He's the master manipulator was another name that was given to, to, to Satan. 
He wants us to be discontent, right? He, he wants to lie to us. And he wants us to believe those lies. You see, Satan will say things like, ah, yeah, your, your spouse doesn't deserve you, right? Your spouse doesn't deserve you. Or you, could, you, could, you should buy that. You deserve a brand new truck, right? For, forget that. Tell your boss how you really feel about him. Go ahead and do that, right? Satan just continues to lie to us. And when we do that, when we listen to his lies, it brings hardship. Because we start to believe those lies. And it brings on pride. We put ourselves before the people. We put ourselves before God. And we consume our lives by what makes me happy. Instead of what makes other people happy. We were only looking at ourselves. And it takes away those opportunities to serve and to honor God. You see, when we fall into sin, um, when we fall into sin, God tells us to repent from our sin. Right? The word repent is actually a military term. Um, Scott, come here for a moment. I need your help. I want you to stand right here and face me. Carson, come here. Give me for a moment. He's over there playing on his phone. All right, so Carson, Carson, I want you to face Scott right here. All right, so Scott is going to represent sin. All right, now this sin could be different for everybody. All right, so Scott could be pornography. He could be pride, gossip, a number of different things. Carson represents us all right so when we when we repent the word repent and God tells us to repent from our sins it literally means to do an about face so I want Carson to look at me when we are facing our sin when we're facing Scott who represents sin literally to repent is to turn around and go the opposite direction and to look at the cross is where we should stay focused on it literally means to do a 180 and go the opposite direction it's a military term that they used in the Bible and so often what happens Carson, turn like this for a minute. Turn back to Scott. So, ha so often what happens in our lives, we just do this. We just turn a little bit, right? And our sin is still in our vision, right? So what happens is we see that temptation and we go after it. But God tells us to go the exact opposite way to turn our back towards our sin. So often when we look this way and our sin is still in our path, we fall into that sin. All right? It's, it's not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was even tempted in the Bible. And we know that Jesus never committed sin. So it's okay to be tempted, right? But it's not okay to enter into that sin. All right, Carson, you have a seat. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, guys. Um, I like this illustration a lot. Um, I had a, a friend of mine <laughs> told me this once, and he said, imagine that you're, that you're a guy, okay? Or it, could be a, it could be a girl, but imagine you're a guy and you're driving down the road, and you see this smoking hot girl, all right, who's running down the road, running down the sidewalk, all right? Her hair's flying back in the wind, and, you know, you're driving by yourself, and you see her, and you recognize, man, that is a beautiful piece of creation that God has made. And you, you see it, and, and that is okay, all right? It's okay to recognize beauty, but what's a sin is when you're driving down the road, and you see that woman, you drive around the block again to see her again, right? 
that's when you start to sin is when, you're, when you can't take your eyes off that, whatever that sin might be. I like that illustration because, you know, to be tempted is not a sin. But to go and enter into that sin and to put your mind in the wrong places is a sin. All right? You see, Satan attacks the gifts that are most effective for the glory of God. You see, we all have a story. Every one of us. Part of my story is that when I was young, I had a terrible speech impediment. So bad I would spend hours a day with a specialist to help train me how to speak. You see, my biggest fear in life, my biggest fear in life is this, standing in front of people and speaking. That's my biggest fear in life. And Satan uses that against me, right? So what he says to me in my ear is, Tyler, you're going to speak in front of people today. People are going to laugh at you when you mess up your words, right? You're stupid, right? That's what Satan does. He brings up the past. He brings up the past the things that we struggle with the most. He's the master manipulator and the master of all lies. But we are so thankful that we have a God who loves us despite our mistakes in the past or despite what has happened to us in the past. God can heal us and make us new. It says, regularly expressing our thanks to God is one of our best weapons against all of life's battles. See, just like in the story, when the man was healed, not only did, did he go to Jesus before he was healed, but after he was healed, he went to Jesus and he was praising Jesus. So often in life, we just go to him during our hard times. But God desires for us to have a relationship with him. God desires for us to praise him and to worship him and to be thankful for what he has done for us. As we wrap up this series in Philippians, there's a really good illustration and I stole this from a man named Francis Chan. Imagine that this rope all right, imagine that this rope is your existence. Imagine that this little red part right here is your life here on earth. All right, we know that life here on earth is, is, is short. We know that there's a finish line, right? Paul talks about that in Philippians, about the finish line of this earth and how we need to stay focused on the cross and not on our sins and not on our past but to stay focused on the future right so so often we as people focus so much on consumerism we focus so much on ourselves we focus so much on things that that really don't matter in existence you see the bible tells us we, Pastor Tim talked about this a couple of weeks ago. What we do here on earth will impact what happens in eternity. You see, so often we get so consumed by consumerism, we get so consumed about saving up money to buy that truck or saving up enough money to retire so that we can uh, eat really good food, so we can travel, so we can do all these little things that are so self-consumed. And yet we forget, we forget about the billions and billions and billions of years that we're going to live in eternity. And when you put that in perspective, it really changes how we live our lives. And it really shows us how we need to have a thankful heart for what God has done for us. 
Stop looking at the, the path. Stop listening to the lies that Satan tells us that has happened just like in my story 10 years, 20 years ago. But yet I still believe those lies. And so I have to go to God and say, God, help me so that I do not believe Satan and help me focus on you and help me focus on the cross. And let me remember that just like Paul talks about finishing strong here on earth, because what we do here will impact what happens for eternity. I love that illustration. So what is one thing you can start doing this week to produce a thankful heart? That is the question we want to leave today. What is one thing you can do? Right, it's very easy in this world to complain or to, to, to bicker, um, to look at the negative side of everything. God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to focus and be content, just like Paul was. Right? Even when Paul was in prison, he was content and he was thankful because he understood what eternity was. He understood the end game. And he stayed focused on the finish line and not the distractions of the world. Right now, as we finish up today, we want to do just that. We want to thank God and praise Him for the many things that are going on in our lives because so often we focus on the negative and we focus on God as a genie in a bottle, right? We rub the bottle and Jesus appears and we say, Jesus, I need this and I need that. Or this is so hard right now, I need you. When it's very clear in the Bible that Jesus wants to hear our praises as well. All right? It talks all the time about going to God in prayer and praise. And so we want to do that today. We're going to circle up in groups of three or four, and we just want to praise God and just thank Him for the many blessings that He has given us. All right? So it could be a practical thing, it could be a spiritual, or it could be a relational but just name a couple things that you are thankful for. So we'll give you about three or five minutes. Go ahead and stand up, circle around, find someone to pray with.